There's a passage in the Old Testament that talks about a man saying, God, I want to see you. And so God hid him in the, in the rock, and there was a great earthquake, and God wasn't there. There was a great fire, and God wasn't there. There was great wind, and God wasn't there. But then there was a still, small voice, and there he was. And every time we come together, he's present. And where the Bible says his word is like a hammer, breaks bondages, it talks about how his word is powerful, it's alive, it talks about how it's creative. It can take what, where there's a vast void of darkness and create light. It can take where there's nothing and create something. What, they can take what is lost and, and devoured and restore it back. And what does that is not an explosion, a fire, uh, emotionalism. It's the still small voice that's going to speak to you today because his word is present. So if there's something that's needing broken in your life, that's got you bound, if there's something that needs to be restored, if there's something, listen how it'll be done. Don't look for the explosion. Don't look for the wind. Don't look for the, the earthquake and the fire. Listen, this morning, every time you come to church, look for and listen for that still, small voice, and you'll be amazed at how when you come, you never leave the same. Never, never the same. Never the same. Whenever, listen, as long as you're here, as long as the days have changed, as long the Holy Spirit will bring you exactly what you need for that day. You know what? If you're eating manna again, and he's saying the same thing to you again, here's what I'll tell you. It's because you need it. If you got something different, if the quail arrived, and what I'm using is just talking about the Old Testament, how God brought quail and how God brought manna, and they'd go out and gather manna, but then they, they, they were saying, That's, I just don't want to have this bread, and God brought quail. How many of you know what I'm talking about? If something else arrives, listen, it's because you need that. But just know this and just know that God is good and that you can come every time you come to church, every time you come to sit before him, every time you open up his word, that he will speak to you and he'll give you the very thing you need to break the yoke of bondage, to restore what the, kink, the, the worm has eaten, to, he, to, to bring life where there's death, to bring light where there's darkness. And if you hold on to that, Father, I thank you this morning that today, where there's darkness, your word is bringing light. Where there's brokenness, your word is bringing healing. Where you're, well, whatever it might be, listen, he is doing a work today to say that. Say, Father, thank you for working in me. Father, we lift our hands to you. We just bow our heads before you. And we just say we're open and we're ready to receive what you would say, what you would have to impart to us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, it's good to, good to be uh, in church, and I've really enjoyed really the last three or four weeks um, uh, in this, this kind of just ex expressing my heart of what the Lord has been talking uh, to me about. You know, there's times as a pastor you talk about, uh, and you know, the Bible talks about how uh, a pastor is like a shepherd, right? God is the chief shepherd, but like as a, a pastor is an under shepherd. So he tends the flock, right? You've maybe heard of that maybe analogy as the, the body of Christ. We're like sheep, right? Um, and yet, yet there's a pastor that's like a shepherd. And so he is to know the state of his flock, right? Um, and so there's, you know, they talk about the, you know, the, the, the shepherd would have a hook and there would be a rod, but there would also be a staff. A rod would be to beat the animals away, not to beat the sheep. And the staff, all right, would be there to, it had a hook on it to where it could, if they got stuck or fall off, a, they could grab them out or they could pull them back and lead them back. And, and so there's, there's, there's times as, as, as a pastor in that, in that office or in that, that, that what God has designed where you know that you need to minister on this. In other words, like you know that the sheep need this certain food because of what's going on in this day and age. Or you know that family needs to be ministered on. You know that 
finances needs to be ministered on. We need to hear what God has to say about family and finances and, and hope and, and all these kind of things. But then there's times that, um, it, that you don't have just a, a message. It's more like uh, expressing the state of, um, I don't know, here's what I'm trying to explain to you. Is I'm, this, whole, this whole message is not uh, something that I could say that everybody uh, is always dealing with, but it's something that this herd, if you will, has to hear, okay? It's not that all the sheep have got to, this is just for us, for us, this is what's been going on in my heart, and so this is where, where, where we're going and where I, I feel like the Lord is leading us, and he has been talking to me a lot about, and that's what I'm talking to you about now, um, is this, going beyond, uh, getting outside of the box that we know, um, and sometimes we're in a box and we don't know it, uh, but we, we, you know, we, we, we don't ever get outside of the boundaries of what we know. Um, we feel like we're okay because we're in a glass box. We can see further, but I believe God wants us to go beyond uh, where our current status of life. He wants us to know a few things. We talked about that in week one. We talked about uh, for two weeks about living a different way, some things that we need to do, some things we need to know was week one, some things that we need to do, right? And we talked about how to live our life and live our life. Last week, we talked about how we can live on these different levels, and, and God wants us to know that we're to be living on purpose and, and how when when we live from a place of purpose, we, we're, we're hooked up with our creator or our partner, and then the impossibilities become possible. Why? Because there's one in the mix with you. There's just like that song that uh, we've been singing a lot of. There's another in the fire, right, with you. Uh, there's somebody in the mix partnered with you. And so we've been talking about that. But this, this morning, um, I really, um, this is the things that we must do, not just how to live, but this would be uh, part three of Last week and the week before his message, right? So um, this is part three of a message that was only going to be one part. And, uh, and it's a, the, the title of it is th- Three Things We Simply Must Do. Three Things That We Simply Must Do as a Church. And uh, to, 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 to get a picture and paint a picture in your heart this morning, I want you to throw up that uh, sailboat if you can. And uh, this has been uh, uh, something that's been a thought of mine for a while, probably since uh, June of last year, and that's a sailboat. Uh, there was just a, a word of the Lord to, to my heart, uh, to me, um, uh, concerning just the things that your heart desires, and, and it's almost like uh, a sailboat, like you're going to catch the wind, you're like right there, uh, keeping the sail set uh, for what God's doing. And so I, I've been looking into that, I looked into, you know, I've looked at how sailboats work, I've looked, just things that the Lord's been breathing on, and and um, I have one up on my desk in my office, and, and um, as I was thinking about go, like breaking out, going beyond, and what the Lord has been talking to me about, it, the, the ship is like the church. We're, we're on, God has a plan, He has a position. The ship is to be directed by the wind, yet, yet, whoever's at the helm doesn't have to follow the wind. You can steer it however you want. That's choice. But, but God has a, a way that he would desire for us to go. And the, the, in order for that boat to move, it requires a sail. In order for that boat to move, it requires a sail. Let me tell you this. In order for God to do what you, your heart desires, in order for life to flow, for, in order for his, his church to be built, it re- does require the sail, or it does require the wind, the, the, the Holy Spirit. He's the one that draws. He's the one that empowers. He's the one all, so there, there's something about, about the wind, but there's something about our role in capturing or working with the wind to bring about the desired results God would want. And so what I want to talk about is three things that we must do if we're going to partner with the Holy Spirit. So we're not just talking types and shadows and, you know, whatever. We're going to partner with the Holy Spirit or the wind. All through the Bible you see the wind, right? If we're going to partner with the Holy Spirit to bring about what He desires, it's going to take you and me holding on to a few things. As, as a church, we're going to have to hold on to a few key points. And if you look at a sail, most sails that you'd be familiar with, you would say they're in the shape of a, help me out, 
a triangle, right? And so a triangle is three sides and three points, right? And so a, a triangle, so that, but if, if one of those three points comes undone, what happens to that sail? Just flops in the wind. It doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. How many of you have ever felt like your life doesn't go anywhere? I would venture to say, if that's the case, I would ask you this morning, what did you let go of? What is one of those things that God has said to you and you let go of and you got this and you got this, but there's that one piece you've let go of and, you, and, and so when the Lord is blowing, when the wind is blowing, you're not going anywhere because you let go. You let go of that. Now here's what I tell you. Grab it again. It'd be amazing when you just tie that off and all of a sudden pulls you right on. And so what, some of the things that, the, that I, I tell you over nine years, here, here I've, I've actually been pastor in this church for nine years, going on nine years. It's crazy, right? Like I hadn't quit for nine years. That's pretty awesome, right? I mean, I think that's cool. Because you see all these facts that people quit or whatever. I'm like, hey, not, not me. I'm not quitting, right? Anyway, I thought that was cool. I was like, hey, nine years, didn't quit. All right, still got more. Hey. But over those nine years, six years full-time, in other words, not running a business at the same time, six years full-time um, doing this, and what I found is, just like folding a sheet, right, a lot, like, have you ever tried to fold a sheet by yourself? Isn't that kind of a pain? You fold it, and you got to go to the other end, and then you try to tighten it up, and if you're wanting to do a really crisp job, you know, it's like you're going, you constantly... I found that in the church, like as the church, as the pastor of the church, where the Lord is saying, hey, do this, do that, you know, there's, there's times I grab one corner of the sail, kind of like you would grab a sheet, and you pull it tight. But, but oftentimes, I pull that corner, and I let go of the other corner, right? And, and, and when I, that happens, it's like, this is the most important corner. And then I go over here, and this is the most important corner, and then over here, and this is the most important. You know what happens is not everything that you, you desire comes about. Like all that God wants to do, it's like you let go of one side for the other. And what I found is I'm not to hold a lot of the corners or any of the corners. I'm really to just help di direct what the Lord would say on where to turn the sail. And you know what it takes? It takes us as the body holding the corners. It takes us to go beyond where we're at, to, go where, to, to fulfill the purpose for which we've been created. Listen, it's more than a nine to five. It's how he set us in the body. Your purpose, my purpose, is found in the body of Christ. Period. Where you work, all, all these kind of things, God has a plan. God has, but listen, it starts from the place that he joined you to, the body of Christ. And so it's important for us to see this and understand this. As a matter of fact, for the picture that God designed to come about, it takes us understanding this, this, this one scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, 10 through 12. And this is out of the Passion Translation. It says this, The one who descended is also the one who ascended. In other, Jesus, in other words, Jesus. He ascended above the heights of the heaven in order to begin the restoration of the fulfillment of all things. So there's a picture that God has in his heart that's not finished yet. Think about that. There's a picture that God has in his heart that's not finished yet. And, and so to start that painting, how many of you remember the big poofy hair guy? He'd get like the paint, the, you know, he'd sit and, huh, what's his name? Bob Ross. Bob Ross. He's awesome. I love PBS. Remember PBS? Public Broadcasting? Yeah. Anyway, I'll be like, watching him. He's like making trees and he's like, we're going to put a little snow right here and the sun's going to be, anyway, he's painting this picture and he'd, he'd start and he'd paint this amazing picture. And you know what God did to, to create the picture? He started it by sending Jesus. But it's not done yet. You, you, know what he, you know what he did to make the picture more complete? He sent not just Jesus, he sent you. He sent me. So you think about that. I'm part of the picture that God created, that he had a restoration, a rest, the restoration and fulfillment of all things. He sent Jesus to start it, but he put you and I in the picture, we're a piece of the picture to, to, to complete it. So there, there's a part that I play. 
There's a part that you play. And it says that as he appointed, uh, he, and so he sent Jesus, and then he appointed some with God power, we talked about, or grace, to be apostles, and some with grace to be prophets, and some with grace to be evangelists, and some with grace to be pastors, and some with grace to be teachers. And their calling is to, is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. And so one of the things we said, and we got to get this down, is this, that I am a minister. You are a minister. Not, not just because I have a, uh, a Bible degree and I am ordained by God. Listen, you've been ordained by God. You've been chosen for such a time as this. And you're a minister. And you're going to say, if you don't settle that in your heart that God chose me to minister, you will never fulfill the purpose for which you've been created. Like, you're supposed to be on the picture. You're supposed to be in the picture. You are, but you need to function in that role. But it starts by you understanding you are a minister. So there's, there's some corners that, that we all hold on this sail that will allow God, uh, when, or when the Holy Spirit blows, to, to bring about, man, shh. Maybe just because I'm pastoring a church and I see the ins and outs of the church every day, and I've watched it for nine years. But I also think because the heart of the Father gets put in a pastor, it's a work that's not of, a, of, of mine, okay? The same way if when God calls you, there's a grace. It's like there's, you step into an office. Like in a doctor's office, there's tools that I don't have in my office. But if I was called to be a doctor, there would be these tools that I'd have access to. They're in the office. And so the same way is true with the pastor. But here's what I know. I know that God's plans for the church are bigger, and he's still building his church. Like, like there's more. Like God wants to continue to build. The reach is greater. You know what? It's amazing. I've seen just as of late, and you maybe have seen some of this stuff too, that how there's a lot of people that are declaring Jesus as Lord that you would have never thought would be declaring Jesus as Lord? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Anybody see Kanye West or, or uh, Magic, uh, Magic Johnson? He, he quit the NBA. Uh, he hasn't been playing for a while, but I understand that. But he like stepped out so he could serve in his church more. Interesting. Like these people that you're saying, wow, what? They, they're sensing something. They're hearing something. There's a drawing. Like here's what I would say. I'd say there's a blowing. There's a blowing going on. Like the Holy Spirit is moving. No one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws, right? And so he's blowing. He, there is a, the season in which we're in, the day in which we live, that, that, that God in the last days, he says, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. That's you. That's you. If I was to say, hey, all of you stand up, guess who would stay sitting? Nobody. Why? Because you're included in the all. And so he's pouring out his spirit on you, and he's pouring out his spirit out upon all flesh. And the question is, will I yield to the poor? Did you know, did you know even this, and this is, I'm kind of off here a little bit, but I'm going to get back. Did you know uh, if, if, if God pours on you, but you don't open up? How many of you know, when God's pouring, if you don't open up to what you're not filled. Did you, it, it still takes us responding and tipping our cup, tipping our heart to what he's saying. That's so cool. All you have to do is tip your heart to what he's saying. And so uh, this morning, um, talking about this, talking about the three, the three corners of the sail, or talking about the points of sail, if we could grab a corner, tell your neighbor to grab a corner, grab a corner. Hey, grab a corner. How many of you know, hey, can you grab that other end? And we'll fold that sheet up and we'll put it just like it needs to be. Why? Because there's tension on the other corner. Sometimes tension, we think tension is a bad thing. But did you know if there's not tension on all those points, the sail doesn't work. And what has happened over the, these nine years is there's been times there was a tension to, to reach the lost. I'm going to talk about these three things. Reach the lost, disciple the found, and then empower the called. Reach the lost, that would be one corner, disciple the found, and empower the call. That, that would be all of us here empowered to go out and to be a witness, like to know the Holy Spirit, to know. 
But, but there's been times there's a tension. It's like, we got to reach the lost. we got to reach the lost. And you run over to the corner, right? And you pull that corner, and, and you're like, and, and at first, right, it looks good until you try to pull it a little tighter, and it just kind of, you got to run back over to the other side, right? And you got to realize that, listen, there is a reaching the lost. There is a discipling the found, and there is a peace that if we would hold to, it would allow God to fill the sail. There's the other piece, and I think as a church, we've 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 there's times we've done we've done really well, like reach the lost and 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 then disciple the found. I think I've went this way and I went this way, and I think I've stuck here, right? Like I'm I'm holding on to both. I think we, we're good. The tension is right. I remember um, uh, Pastor Joel Sims. He said this. He said uh, telling a story about Brother Hagen. Man, I got talking to a pastor that said, uh, Brother Hagen, I'm really frustrated. I'm I'm upset, like, in my heart, I, I, I know we got to reach the lost. I know we got to reach the lost. But yet, at the same time, I know that the word is so in, important. I know that the word is so important. And, um, and, and the thing about it is, is how was that question, remember we were in there, how was the question formed? What would you rather have? The, uh, what would you rather have? People? That's what it was. What would you rather have? People? Or, or what was the other one? Help me out. I've just had a big brain blank. Do you want people? Oh, here's what he said. Do you want people or do you want God? Because this is how it was positioned. This is how the 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 congregation was talking to the pastor. Because he began reaching people, like in other words, being evangelistic, like going in, in into these places, right? Like just where they're like, pastor, pastor, you are becoming. I want God in my service. And, and, he's, and, and the pastor's like, I do too, right? But I also want people. And, and anyway, Brother Hagen said to him, he, said, he was talking with them, and, and he said, just getting some counsel. How many of you know it's, a, it's good to get counsel? And said, am I, am I off here? He said, well, what do you want, people or God? And he said, I want both. And he said, uh, he said you're the first person that, has ever, I believe, has ever answered that question right, that he had talked to in, in, the, in the churches that he had been. He said, the tension tells you you're doing it right. The tension tells you you're doing it right. It's working. And um, th- there's a grab, there's a heart, there's a heart for, for all, all the pieces. And I think it's really important as a church that we would, we would not just be a God church. Like, you understand what I'm saying? Like, um, us four no more, look how spiritual I am. Look what! Look at! Uh, we're just gonna be a bless me club, and that's it. But it's also not good that all we're doing is harvesting the wheat or reaching the lost and letting it lay in the field, right? That's not okay. Um, but it's also not good. Uh, so, so there's time. There's the, like the missing component. You a lot of times you see a church that's that's reaching the lost, but then you see the 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 the, the testimony that they carry. It, it, it's void of power. It's void of uh, the difference of what's the difference between them and the world. There's really no difference. They don't even know the difference is the fact that what separates them from the world is not their doctrine, not their belief, but simply the fact that they've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? For a purpose. Remember, the still Holy Spirit was going to come upon you to be a, a witness. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is not to give you tinglies, to make you fall over, if you're in this camp, okay, Holy Spirit to make you tingly or, or to make you fall over or whatever, but it is to be a witness. And so you, a lot of times you'll see people, we're reaching the lost, you'll, say, you'll see a church that's just really heavy on, you know, like our, our crew, our group, but what the key is, is this piece that is the next point on the sale, and that would be empowering the call, that would be talking a little bit more about, listen, You've been called, now let's talk about getting you out there, right? Let's talk about those kind of things. So number one, let's talk about the first point. We'll talk about the last point at the very end. And I think the, the last piece about getting us out there, we're going to have to... We're going to have to get out there. We're just going to have to walk out. 
and, and just know that even if I jump, listen, I'm going to land. Okay? All right, reach the lost. So number one, point one, it would be this. If, as a church, if we're going to go beyond, we're going to have to reach the lost. There's a story that you maybe have read or maybe you've heard. Maybe you identify really well with one of these sons in the story, the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. You've heard it talked about. And it talks about how there's, in this story, there's a, the son, they come to the, their father and said, give us our inheritance. And so they, he, the father divides unto them the inheritance. And one of them takes all that he has. And he's like, man, this is a lot. And he runs... And he goes to the city and wastes it away. The Bible says on squander, squanders it away, on riotous living, makes lots of friends. But then when his money runs out, there's no friends. The party's over. And he's hungry. And he's lost. And he goes and he finds a farmer to feed, he said, he, to feed the pigs that he could just eat in, during this time of famine that he would be able to eat. And he said, it says that he would gladly have eaten the pig slop. Isn't that crazy how you were a son in the house of a king, and yet, that, I mean, that's what you were designed for, and then yet here he is in the slop, and, and, and he comes back to the father, and he says, oh, I'll come back, and I'll just serve in his house, and I'll, I, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. I, and a lot of times, we identify with that, that one, or maybe you've never identified with that because you're just really, really great, but I've identified with that uh, plenty of times where I feel so backslidden, I feel dirty, I feel like I'm... I was a son in the house, and now I just, I don't, when I come to the Father, have you ever come to the Father like this? Not on your knees, but like head down, eyes on the ground, can't look you in the eye, know what I've done. The enemy tempted me, then accused me, and condemned me. And I come to the Father, and he says, he lifts, his head, he lifts my head, and he puts a, my, a robe on me and a ring upon me, and I'm like, God. Right? Have you ever experienced the love of God like that? And then at the other time, I think I've, I've, been, I've been the other son in the house where, where I, I feel like I'm, I've done enough right. Like have you ever gotten to that place where like or in a season you feel like you've done enough right and you're wondering why you don't have the party that somebody else is getting? Right? And so again, self-concern, right? But there, there's got to come a time that we, we, we don't identify with either one of those in the story. If we're going to reach the lost, we've got to become the other son in the story, and that's Jesus, the son, telling the story. Telling the story of this and this, that the father comes and prepares, and in the house, he, you can have the party if you've been in the house. Listen, you can, you can have the, the, he's already prepared the calf. We need to start telling the story about, about a God that, that found us when we were lost. We need to be the one not identifying any longer with the two in the story. Why? Because if you've been lost and you were found, guess what you are? You're found. And as far as he's concerned, the ring's on your finger, and the robe you are carrying is called the robe of righteousness, and it's on you. Because of the blood of Jesus. And so it's time that we start telling that story. That I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because it wasn't because of my works. I can't boast about it. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you the good news. The good news is not just that you can come, but that you can stay. That's the good news. And so we're going to have to, we're going to, have to reach the lost. We're going to have to learn to tell the story. And we're going to have to learn, if we're going to tell the story, and if life is going to be found in this church, if life is going to be found in my life, it's going to be because there's a flow. How many of you know the Bible talks about how there's life along the rivers and it doesn't see along the banks of the river. It doesn't see when drought comes. It doesn't see when, when, when there's a famine. Why? Because there's life there. There's a flow there. Well, if there's going to be flow in my life, it's going to be because I'm pouring in to another vessel. So here's what I would tell you. If I'm going to hold to that corner, that corner is a corner that we got to hold to. Because if that one flaps into the wind, what are we? We're not, the, 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 the sail's not working. So hold to that corner. Grab it and say this. Say, I got to, I mean, to your stuff, you got to say, I got to find some vessels to pour into. Just like that widow. She found some vessels and, and Elijah said, don't gather a few, gather a bunch. And it says that her house was filled with vessels that were full out of the little bit that flowed from her jar. A lot of times we disqualify ourselves from pouring into anybody and reaching anybody that's lost because we say we're just as lost and we say we'd only have a little. I understand that, but it is your little bit. 
that has the greatest, the, the little bit that you know, that has the greatest impact because you're not dependent upon what you know, you're dependent upon his direction and what he said. It's the same example as uh, somebody that, that has influence, like, like Kanye West, he was on Jimmy Kimmel Live, and here, he doesn't know a whole lot about doctrine and all these kind of things, but here's what he does know, what he does know, Jesus is king, Jesus saved, he knows, he knows this. He knows this, and you know what he has to say? This, and this right here is having an impact that, that all of this closed can't have. What do you know? What, what has he done? What has Christ done? Listen, pour out, pour out your testimony. Tell me what he said about you. Tell me how he found you. Tell somebody why. Because there's, they're lost. And you know what? God is drawing like never before. You're seeing it all over. You know, the enemy likes to paint a picture about darkness and, and all the kind of things in the world of sin and this and that. And, and it's getting darker and it's getting darker. Listen, people are getting hungrier. You said four months till harvest, Jesus said. He said, I tell you, look up right now. There are so many people that are hungry, they just need to hear about Jesus. Well, I don't know enough about Jesus. No, you might have a little in the jar, but if you would, if you would pour that into the vessels that, that you have in your life, what would happen is God would fill his house. Hold to that corner. That might be the corner that you're holding right now. Listen, you've been called. Your assignment might change. You, you might be called to hold to that corner and say, ah, I'm going to reach the loss. I'm going to reach the loss. I'm going to reach the loss. But as you hold that corner and as you stay in that house, what happens is, and as you hold that sail, God begins to fill you. And now you're not just reaching the lost. You're pouring yourself into the found. You're discipling the found. You'll see someone that was lost and was once this. He's now pastor in a church. He's doing this. Or he's out in the mission field or whatever it might be. He is all about, and he knows what would happen. What happened? Did his call change? No. His assignment changed, but he's still holding the sail. Hold the sail. Grab a part of it, grab a piece of it, and God will let the Holy Spirit blow. And what will happen is, is life will be found. You'll, whew, there's something about wind on your face. You know, there's something about like a nice breeze. All right, let's keep going here. So, number two is this. Um, you know, and I have. Uh, th- uh, some of our core values in this, we never forget. We never forget where we came from. But God, he reached down and he used someone to bring us to new life in Christ. And so we remember that we've been reached and so we reach for others. Every Sunday should be somebody's first Sunday. If it's not, that's my fault. That's how you have to think. If somebody isn't here on Sunday that's new, then here's what I gotta ask myself. Why? Why, or, or, or why, or, or it, this week, maybe not even just in the church, but there's pieces that God has designed, a setting of a body. There is a setting that he designed for their fulfillment. That is a piece of the corner. But, but here's what I'd ask. If, if a vessel is not filled this week, why? That's my call. Just as much as it's your call. It's our call. It's not, it's not all of us doing it together. Sometimes I think we, we think that pastor's gonna fill the vessels on Sunday. But did you know that the, why you, you and I come to church is so that we would be filled, so that we would go out and fill, right? Because otherwise what we are is we're, we can't go beyond. We're, we're, we're boxed in. Guys, the arrow, the whole deal, beyond the four walls, we gotta get out of the box. We gotta get, get out of the box. Um, and, and the empty ones, here's what I found, they're the easiest to fill. Huh? Get some empty ones? You know what's hardest to fill is the coffee that's all the way full. Right? The empty ones. Number two, disciple the found. Let's talk about that for just, a, more than just a convert, but a follower. What is it that ca- causes someone to become a follower? Not just a convert. There's something about, and I believe that you'll see this in Acts chapter 2, when the church originated. How many of you know when, when God starts something, it's awesome? And it's original, and it's right. When we get in and we begin to put our man into it, our system into it, our uh, this is the way it's got to be, blah, 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 into it, 
what happens is, is we can lose some of what God did by design. And what you'll see here is that in, this, in chapter 2, verse 41 through 42, it says those that received the word were baptized. This is right after the, the Holy Spirit the, on the day of Pentecost was poured out and, and they began speaking in other tongues. And here's the deal. You don't have to be worried about speaking in other tongues. Listen, if God's working, God's drawing, he's speaking to hearts, all right? But here's what happened is they were speaking and they were like, what is this? They're drunk, this. And Paul spoke up. And if you know somebody that's scared because of tongues or, or, and something happens and, and they get turned off, listen, and you know about it and you don't speak up, you have the opportunity to play Paul and bring someone to Christ. Okay? These are people that are lost. So just so speak up like Paul. So he spoke up and he says, and though they, they received gladly the word and they were baptized the same day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued. I had this underlined in my notes. I, they continued steadfastly. You know what nowadays, today's day and age, what more often than not is we start a lot of things, but we don't continue a lot of things. What is it that is, was the continuing or caused the continuing of following Christ? Mind you, at this time, there was great persecution. So to, to, to join and to continue means your life's in jeopardy. <laughs> There's a lot of change going on, but somehow, there was, there, what was the deal? They continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine, it says, in verse 42, in doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. It says, then fear came upon every soul, many, many signs or wonders and signs were done, uh, done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among anyone who had need. You know, I, I, think, I think it's really interesting to me when I look at this. I had some, a bunch of other notes that I wanted to share on what it looks like to be discipled and, and to become a follower and discipling the found and us using our gifts and, and that, kind of th- that kind of thing. But what I found and what the Lord was really talking to me about is this. There's something that the church must be if people are going to remain in church. They're, if they're going to continue steadfastly. And uh, it's going to take... It's going to take the church staying and being like Christ, following Christ. So, so if the church is not following Christ, those that are saved won't continue to follow. So here's what it looks like to be a follower of Christ if you, for you and me. If you are part of the church, if we're going to reach the lost and then we're going to begin to disciple the found, the only way they're going to be discipled or become followers is, number one, if church is a safe place. Safe place. I, I, I told the story in first service about my little boy I saw on Facebook. They had those reminders, you know, where something pops up on your timeline. And my little boy, uh, boys are running from the garden uh, and they got pumpkins in their hand. We grew pumpkins years ago, and they, it was time to carve them. So they're running to the house, and and uh, the two older ones get there first, and they got the bigger pumpkins. And Caleb is my youngest, seven years ago. He's nine now, so he's two and a half. Okay, and he's carrying his pumpkin, and and he says it's heavy, it's heavy. And he's walking up the front steps, and it's just so cute, so precious. And he's in his hand, he's got a steak knife pointed out. He's two and a half. He's got a steak knife and a pumpkin, and I posted this all over Facebook, and I thought, oh my gosh, I did not ever realize he had a steak knife in his hand walking up the steps at two and a half while carrying a pumpkin. Mama's not around anywhere, so, but dad's being dad, right? And I'm thinking, that was so dangerous. Thank you, Lord, that he didn't trip or something silly happened, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, so wow, that is, that's scary to even watch this video. Now, it's not just cute, it's like, now I'm like, okay, get the knife out of his hand, okay? <laughs> but a safe place, a safe place. If, we, if we're going to continue and disciple, it's not going to just simply be by us saying this, Lord, disciple me, right? Because this is, for us to be a follower, we're going to have to be willing for God to disciple us. We're going to have to say, Lord, there's some things about the way that I think that aren't the way that you think. Teach me, right? How many of you know that, that when I get saved, I'm not fully saved? The Bible says I'm saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. There's three, ty- three parts of salvation. Salvation is a work of God. 
But then there is an outworking of my salvation, the Bible says, so I be being saved. For in other words, from glory to glory, I'm changed into his very image as I, as I sit before the word of God. There's a change and a thing that happens. And then it says, I will be saved, and that's I'm sealed into the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. That, that just like the, the, the role that's sealed and has a seal on, only God can open me. Glory to God that I am saved, I'm being saved, and I'm walking more and more into what he's prepared for me. But yet at the, at the end of the day, I'm, 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 my, my confidence is not in the middle, it's in the beginning and the end, right? So that's really cool, right? But, but what does it look like for somebody else to have that same confidence and to enter into their call? Listen, the, entering their call is the stewardship of what they've been given. For you to get saved and to not walk in what and, and steward what's been placed in your hand changes what happens there. Here's how it changes it. Not only what's given to you, but also who enters in. So empowering the called is a very, very, very important part. But unless we reach the lost, and unless someone is discipled and they begin to see what God says and change and, and let God work on them and from one degree of glory to the next, and even while that's happening, they realize, wait a minute, God chose me, I can carry that? Yeah, grab a hold of that. This is the three-part deal, but here's, how, here's the deal. Number one, it's got to be a safe place. How do we keep it safe? With our mouth. Because I was told the story about the pumpkin and the knife. Here's why. Because our mouths are like knives. The Bible talks about how our mouths are like swords. And you know what? It's really easy for us to use our mouths to cut. If people are going to come into the church, we're going to have to be a church that, number one, uses the sword. You have to use your mouth. In this day and age, we are required to use our mouth. I will testify of God's goodness. I will hold the truth. I will always speak the truth in love. I can't speak the truth in love if I'm speaking it from a place of fear, okay? I'm not qualified to speak the truth in love and administer grace because the Bible says, speaking the truth in love that you might administer grace. The whole goal is that grace would come. God's empowerment to set one free. God's empowerment to open eyes. God's empowerment. But for that to happen, it doesn't just require truth. It requires truth and love. And if truth is what you got on the inside, but fear is also what's, what's going on, and what, whether or not they're going to follow Jesus, or whether or not this is going to happen, or whether or not they're going to be right, or just love for self, right, not love for them, what's going to happen is when you speak truth, it's going to become a hammer. It's going to become a knife unsheathed that's swung instead of letting God do a work in administering grace. When I teach in, uh, on Sunday morning, I'm not up here telling you this. You, you better get that vodka out of your freezer. I'm not up here telling you, you better do this, and you better do that, and you better do that. I'm not, I, I don't have any vodka in my freezer. I've never had a drink of anything, but that's, that's me. But I'm not saying, you sinner. Here's what I'm doing. I'm just simply preaching the word. And here's what's happening. When the word is administered, it's a sword. And so it's a sword. And so because it's a sword, it, it trims away the things in our life that are causing damage to us. Why? Because God is so good and he's love. He's speaking the truth in love. What happens is, is, is there's a freeing that happens to you and me. There's an, also an empowering. So the church must be, number one, a safe place. Number two, it's got to have it's got to have eyes, because not only do the mouth has to be right, but our eyes have to be that of love. You're saying, how can your eyes be that of love? What you believe in your heart about somebody will be seen on your face. When I look at people, when people, when people come, if my eyes are not filled with love, here's what they, they'll do. They pass right over, they, or they look right through, like, or they, they, they bring judgment upon just the smell, just anything. So in the, as a church, are my eyes, is my mouth, is my sword sheathed? In other words, do I know how to use it? Do I use it properly? Are my, are my eyes, when I see somebody, are they filled with love or are they filled with judgment? Like, we, you know, I, I think it's crazy when even just seeing some of these the things on, on Facebook um, of of people giving their hearts to Jesus that have, like Kanye West, I'm using him as an example, that has lived a, a life that he has definitely filled with sin, okay? 
definitely filled with sin. Listen, guess what he's probably going to do? The same thing you will do, sin, again. But guess what? He's reaching out for Christ. You know what that should be? That should be celebrated. Not tolerated, right? Celebrated. And, and our eyes should empower. Our eyes, our heart, our belief. There is power in our belief. If you're coaching your team, I got a coach sitting back here, uh, Brad Johnson, coaching his team. But if he, if he as a coach, if he, if he believed that his team was worthless and couldn't win, it doesn't matter how he coached, they would be crippled. If the coach doesn't believe you can, you won't. Because what comes apart, what, listen, for us as a church, what we should be doing is believing in. My eyes should see and, and, and welcome people in. And then number three, the hands. Like our, the, church, the church should be generous. And I, I'm trying to unpack and, and I'm trying to get to where I need to get to really fast. And so I feel like I'm maybe a little bit out, all over there. But Acts chapter 2, 41 through 45, if you read all of that, you'll see, number one, you'll see the truth. You'll see in the mouths, you'll see that there is a welcoming place, that the eyes of people that just stepped in, they were welcomed in, but yet there was this thing that was great trust abounded there. Great trust. Why? Because of generosity. Generosity, it, when you give to somebody, what happens is it builds trust. Not strings attached, but when you give to somebody, trust is built. And that's what happened all in, uh, all in the early days of the church. They, sold, they gave all their marbles, if you will without concern if they had any in their pocket. This is they sold their land and they had things in common. Generosity was a part of who they were. Let me ask you this. Is generosity a part of who I am? Is it a part of who you are? Are my hands always open? Is my, hand, is my hands always open? Is my heart always open to whoever might come in? Is what I have, is it mine or is it God's? That's the key. That's the key to seeing people continue to be discipled. My words, listen, my heart in my hands, my hands always open, God, whatever you would want to do. And I'll tell you, it brings people in, it keeps people with their hands. And the last one is this, I want, you, um, I want, to, I want to close with this, and that's empowering the called. And there's, um, you've been called, I've been called. But how many of you know being called and not being equipped can be challenging, it can be really hard? There's just something that we say a lot around here. It says, because the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. In other words, because God's love is in you, you can be satisfied by nothing except what satisfies the love of God. And so there are things in your heart. I want to read this from Job. It says, Job 32, 6 through 10, it says, I'm young in my years while you're old. He's, this is a young man talking. And he says, hey, I'm young and, and you're old, and, and that's why I'm, uh, I'm a, I was afraid and timid to speak uh, and to tell you what I know. I thought that age should speak, and many years should teach wisdom. But there's a spirit. But there's a spirit in a man. Here's what I would tell you. There's a spirit in you, man. There's a spirit in you. And it's the spirit or the breath of the Almighty. On the inside, what can satisfy you? How many of you know when you're satisfied? It's not here, it's here. And there's a breath in you. There's a, the Spirit of God is in you. And the only thing that will satisfy you is when you move based upon this breath, based upon what this speaks, based upon what your heart speaks. When your heart speaks, guess what? God shows up. When I speak to you from my heart, if, I'm, if we have a heart conversation, if I pour out my heart to you or if I speak to you what's in my heart, what you'll sense, you'll sense God. He goes on and says this. He says, there's a spirit in a man, the breath of the Almighty, that gives him understanding. So there's things that your head won't understand. Proverbs 3, 5 talks about trusting the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your understanding, right? Trust your heart. So he says this, that it gives him understanding. In other words, what should be. Understanding would be how to put it together. Understanding would be one plus one equals 
too. That's understanding. The spirit on the inside of you gives you understanding. And he said, it is not only the old who are wise. You know it's not only the old who are wise. Wisdom is found right here. Right from him. Not only the old who are wise or the elderly who understand justice. Therefore I say, listen to me now and I will declare to you what I know. As a church, we talk a lot about love. As the church, we talk about love. Love your neighbor, love your, you know, all these kind of things, right? We talk about love. But the chapter on love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where we discover what love is, and these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. The next verse says this, follow the way in love. Okay, yeah, we're doing, and, and, Eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially to prophesy. Especially that you would speak, what? Wisdom. The breath, that you would speak from here, the breath of the Almighty into other people's lives. Put up that equation that I have. In our lives today, there is a lot of the same thing that the world faces, there is one plus one. And one plus one equals what? Two. So, in other words, there's, there's things in our lives that we see, and because this is the way it's been, it, when this happens, and, and to me, this, this is the result. There's, there's a one plus one equals two in our world that God would like to change and rearrange, and this is part of carrying a message of the good news and empowering the called. Acts chapter 1, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be a witness. The witness that we're to carry, there is, it's me plus one. It's me, one plus one X equals what? Well, whatever X equals. You know what X is? It's the power. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God with you. It's, it's, it's the spirit of wisdom that would speak, and yet understanding and wisdom says this, but yet there's a spirit on the inside, and I'm here to tell you to empower you that have been called. On the inside, there is one that speaks, and he speaks to your heart, and he says, as much as I want you to walk in love and be kind, I want you to speak for God. I want you to speak with God. God, because you are one X, one plus one X. They're, they're together. You can't separate the two. I want you to use your voice. I want you to raise your voice and say, hey, these men are not drunk as you suppose. I want you to use your voice at the job and speak what? Right here. I want you to use your voice when, when, when this says something different than what you see. I want you to stand in the gap and say, no. No. When you walk by the gate called beautiful and you're on your way and you see the man that's been crippled since he was born and you walk by and you walk by that same gate day after day after day, you've been to the temple time and time again, but that day, something on the inside, when he cries out and says, hey, can I have some money? Something on the inside says, ah. I don't have any money, but what I do have, this is what I got. We're going to have to learn to engage what we got. Listen, to give what we got. How do I know you got something? Because you are part of God's picture. He started it when he sent Christ. He's detailing it when he sent you. And the people I come in contact with and the paths that I cross, I carry, I carry an X factor. I carry the power of God to testify of what? The good news. Listen right here. Because guess what? This is where you believe. This is where all things are possible. This is where if you just listen, not hear, what do you have to say? You've been in those situations where you saw something, and in here you thought, not thought, you, you sensed that's not right. 
And then I would ask you this, would you hold that other corner and let the Holy Spirit blow? And fill the sail and do what you can't do? Listen, you can hold the corner, you can't fill the sail. But if you hold the corner, he can fill the sail. He can do the impossible. And it's what he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1. You might underline this, write this down, not just 1 Corinthians 13. You might say, I've been found. I'm being discipled. And here's what I found. To be a disciple, to be a follower of Christ, it takes me realizing that I've been empowered and called. And I'm not just to walk in love, but I am to carry the Spirit of God wherever I go, that when I see one plus one, I jump in and say, but God. And I wanted to show and close with this video. Not only do we have a miracle walking among us this morning, Hartley was here, walking all up and down. That's a miracle. But you know how easy it is to discount a miracle? It's sad, but we do it that quick. That quick, it's lost. That quick. I wanted you to see this miracle. And you, tell, you, did, you discount this one for me. This is what you carry. Somebody is using their voice and saying this is not okay. Miracles. Good news. Preach, cover your sight to the lost. Someone had to hold the sail. Someone had to dump the water. The water didn't heal them. Watch his complete life flows into this arm. It comes all the way back until where you know what that is? One plus one X. You know what that was? Somebody saying, Lord, you said. God. It's time we reach with him and we hold the sail. And we hold the sail. And we stop trying to be the wind. But we hold the sail. We reach the lost. We say, God, teach me, disciple me, change the way I think. But Father, wherever I go, let me be mindful. Let me be listening here. And let me speak what you would speak. Let me say what you would say. Let me not be silenced, but let me declare your love. Let me know. Let me, here's what I want to tell you. You are been empowered to know this this morning you've been called and you are part of the beautiful picture of good news that God designed for people to hear and it's more than just in our words it's in us moving with God and moving with our hearts moving with our hearts that doesn't sound spooky does it Holy Spirit's not weird he's in you He's awesome. He's mighty. He's powerful. And he has a heart to reach, to heal, to comfort, to restore. But it does take your hands. It does take your voice. It does take us holding the sail so that he can fill it and bring about another story of God's good news that in ages to come, you know what we would be talking about? Arms growing out, little girls running around, hope in hearts, marriages restored, whatever it might be. Listen, wisdom found, uh, uh, lack destroyed. I mean, we're talking about just everything that you see, that there, it would be kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Here's how we ought to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, all hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, if you see something on earth that you don't sense as, as it is in heaven, it's your job, it's my job to move. 
1 plus x equals impossibilities. Amen? Just bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, I thank you so much that more than what I spoke, Lord, you have been speaking to our hearts. You've been painting pictures that only you could paint. Lord, I thank you that not only will we see, but I thank you for a just grant, grant unto us, this is, just as your disciples, they pray, grant unto us boldness. Lord, I just thank you for your church, for us. Lord, just give us boldness. Just ask him for that. Lord, give us boldness. Give us boldness to steward the, the voice of our heart, the, 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 your spirit within us. Give us boldness to step out and hold that corner so you could, you could fill the wind could blow, that, that the places that were stuck and places that could not be moved, that there would just be a, an outpouring of your spirit. You said, in the last days, I would pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Father, I thank you. It's your desire to pour. It's your desire to pour. The, the desire of good things, when I see somebody, it, it's not my desire. The only reason I desire that good is because it came from you. You desire to pour. My confidence is, is in you. And grant unto us boldness to carry a message, the message of Jesus. We just say thank you. Use these hands. Use this church to go beyond the four walls to let our life not just look like another day with 24 hours to and from work, but Lord, that our eyes would be opened and that we would see that in our day, it's made new and there's appointments that you have for us every moment, every day you have by design good things prepared for us to walk in. Out of the box! So we just pray that this morning. I just make that declaration out of the box. Kind of like, uh, get out of bed. Hey, guys. Wake up. Hey, everybody. Out of the box. Father, I thank you that we just get out of the box. I thank you that we're out of the box. We're up and at it. We're out of the box. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're blowing. That you're blowing and you're filling the sails of these hearts here. As we hold to the corners. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Before we close today and, and we go, if you're here today um, and you need healing in your body, um, I just want to invite you down front afterwards. The Bible says that uh, call for the elders uh, uh, among you and, and lay hands on the sick and they would recover. The Bible also says if you don't know where you would spend eternity, but if you just would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Uh, you would be saved. If you've never done that, if you don't know where you'd spend eternity, if you go to heaven or hell, before you leave this building, come, come down front. I'll be down here. Uh, I'd love to, to, to pray with you to receive Jesus and, and see, you, you know, God will do a work. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys and enjoy your Sunday.